about to get started and uh, we are going to record today's session so that folks who were not able to attend can watch at their convenience. So that recording has been started. Terrell, are we ready to go ahead and jump in? Yes, I think that we're ready. All right. Thank you everyone for joining us for the April Acquisition Community of Interest event, the Pillars of Acquisition. Here's a quick agenda overview today. So welcome. We're gonna kick off with some acquisition COI news, introduce our leadership team and discuss the acquisition working group a little bit and some ways that you can get involved with the acquisition COI if you're interested. And then we'll introduce our guest speaker for today, Katie Crompton, and she will spend the bulk of today's session discussing what priorities she has and the pill has for this year. We will have a Q&A period at the end of the, the session today. Uh, if you do have questions throughout the session, you can send them to Terrell or myself or Scott Simpson. Uh, all of us are on the Acquisition Community of Interest team, and we can save those questions and, and bring them up to Q&A. So this is our Acquisition Community of Interest leadership team. Scott Simpson is our government chair. Uh, he supports DHS's Procurement Innovation Lab, the PIL. Julie Dixon is our industry chair at Booz Allen. Terrell Russell is our programs chair from JPI. Alina Sadovanu is our government vice chair at FDIC. Sandy Barsky is our industry vice chair at Oracle. And I am the communications. All right, so a few ways that you can get involved if you're interested. In May, our acquisition community of interest is having an open member meeting. So this is a call to acquisition professionals, folks who are interested in acquisition innovation in the federal government uh, IT space, and to talk about the hot topics. What is your agency doing? Uh, what acquisition innovation ideas have you heard that you're curious of other agencies are doing? So that, uh, that member meeting is live and we'd love to see some of you there. In June, we will have a, an event on solicitation best practices. So we have an event and then a white paper coming out related to that topic. So if you are interested in attending the event or participating in the white paper development, please reach out to the acquisition coi at gmail.com account. And then last but not least, if there's another acquisition related topic that you'd like to hear about, you'd like to lead an effort on, again, please reach out to us and, and we are happy to help give you a platform to, to bring that idea to life. You can follow us on LinkedIn to know what we're doing and get involved. Just search acquisition COI on LinkedIn. And when we share this deck, uh, that link is embedded so you'll be able to follow us on LinkedIn and reach out. So I mentioned the acquisition working group. So the acquisition working group is the government industry arm of the all government uh, CSCRIM COP. So the working group is sponsored by Laura Stanton, assistant commissioner at GSA's ITC. Government chairs are Kina Coleman, Wale Akun, and Tom Smith. And industry chairs are John Amos and Michelle Moss. So this group leads this acquisition working group, which the goal is to bring together government and industry folks to discuss cybersecurity, acquisition integrity, um, really focused on the C scrim, uh, the C scrim topic. So here are the group's ob uh, uh, objectives. And again, you can read a little bit more when we send the deck out. But we wanted to put this group in front of everybody today because 
there are lots of ways to get involved with this group. So if you're interested again in acquisition, if you want to, to uh, volunteer and be a part of ACT IAC, this is a, a great way to get started. So there's three work streams within the acquisition working group and they're all looking for volunteers. So you can reach out to COI at actiac.org to, to uh, volunteer for any or all of these different work streams. So with that introduction, I think we are ready to pass it over to Terrell to introduce our guest speaker for today. Awesome, thank you very much, Nicole. Um, so as Nicole mentioned, as we're going through, if you have any questions, you can send them to us or you can add them to the chat um, down here at the bottom and we will make sure that we get to them during the Q&A session. So um, I'm so excited today that I get to introduce Katie Crompton. Um, hi, Katie. Uh, Katie is the director of the DHS Procurement Innovation Lab, or PIL. And Katie, you have a little bit about yourself here on the screen, but would you like to introduce yourself and share a little bit about your background and acquisitions and what excites you about managing and directing the PIL? Sure, thanks. Um, as my bio on this uh, slide deck shows, I am a self-proclaimed procurement nerd. I have worked in the federal government for 25 years, starting in accounting, worked my way through supply chain, program management, and finally contracting. And by chance, I landed in procurement. And I have been absolutely grateful that that is where I landed. It's a great fit. I love the field. There's always new things to learn. There's always new challenges. Um, I grew up in Army contracting. And through Army contracting, I landed in the IT mission, where that allowed me to really explore and push the boundaries of how we have always done it. And what excites me about working with the pill is that we focus on breaking down those barriers to inefficiencies. And that excites me. And it also excites me working with a team of contracting ninjas who inspire us to do things in a way that breaks down the red tape and move us away from the, the mindset of how we have always done is just really, uh, it's my bread and butter. I just love that. Awesome. And it says here that you enjoy cooking. What is your number one go-to dish? Um, well, according to my neighbors, I am the queen of appetizers. Uh, so apparently I put on a really great appetizer spread. And anytime my older kids come home, they want appetizer night. So I guess that is my forte. Awesome. Good to know. I'll have to get some recipes for you. <laughs> I'm terrible at them. So. <laughs> Um, so I know when we were talking earlier, you said that your innovation journey uh, started uh, in 2016 and that you had a problem that you were having trouble solving. Um, what was that issue and how did that impact your career path? Um, great question. So truly the journey to innovation did kick off in uh, about 2016. I was kind of a little bit already on the path trying new things. Um, but in 2016, what I learned was I had to get uncomfortable because comfortability was the killer of innovation. Um, a little background on what that problem was is we needed to respond to a real world instance within hours. Um, an adversary had done something that was bad. We needed to respond to it. And this was an issue that was very, very time sensitive, and it re really required us um, using novel technology and contracting methodologies. And from this little small thing, we were able to solve the problem, break down the red tape fast, collaborate and reach across the table with legal policy and the end user in a way that wasn't traditional and many weren't comfortable with. And we were able to solve it. We were able to solve it within hours versus weeks with if we had done it traditionally. And from there, it grew into this concept of, can we recreate it? What is this touch point? How, can, can we scale it on a bigger level? And from there, it's grown into some of the things um, in some of the legacy organizations that I work for, some of the amazing things that they are doing. One of the major impacts uh, is that, that it had on me is it required me to trust my leadership in a manner that normally we don't trust our leadership. I had to trust them 
that they were going to have my back and that they were going to provide me top cover. And it also required for them to trust me in a manner that wasn't traditional. So I, that was a very major impact for me. Uh, it changed me as a future leader and it changed how I led. Um, it was crucial in that instance that that top cover was brought to the table for me to succeed um, and trusting my leadership. Um, and it resulted in me trusting myself in the biz business decisions that I was making. Um, it also impacted me because it challenged me to begin looking at procurement and the challenges through a different lens. Um, I had to remove some of those roadblocks and some of those cobwebs out of my own head of this is how we have always done it and change my own mindset. It, it really forced me out of my comfortability zone in a way that was very, very positive and proactive in where I started to go in my career. Um, it also made me realize and notice the challenges and the roadblocks that we put in our own past. And, and in many ways in the acquisition community of how we make it harder for ourselves. It, so it inspired me to be a different leader, a different men mentor who provided a space for others to innovate and be comfortable in trying new things. Uh, the, the individuals that have worked with me have that safe space to fail. Uh, failure is not a bad thing. We learn from that. If you win a game all the time, you're not going to learn what's wrong with your defense in a basketball game. So learning and failing are very, very crucial to innovation. And it also started to make me look at my past and how I did some really great innovative things in the beginning of my career, but I wasn't necessarily bringing others along on that journey with me. And then I needed to share that knowledge and I had to support others in a different capacity to allow them to grow. So really that one incident, instance was a culmination of a career and put me on a completely different trajectory of where I needed to go as a contracting professional, where I needed to go as a leader and where I needed to go as a mentor for the future generation in this profession. That's awesome, Katie, thank you so much. You were mentioning a couple of times that you had to break down the roadblocks. And I know that innovations often met with some degree of skepticism. Um, you know, there's that mentality, if it's not broke, don't fix it. Don't go out of your way to make trouble. Um, how do you work to change the culture of the status quo and have that buy-in for innovation from the bottom up and the uh, top down? Yes, it's not easy changing status quo. Uh, people don't like change. Every individual comes to the table with their own experiences and their own comfortability. And we have to appreciate that change and trying new things is not comfortable for all people. Change is hard. And that's being a human being, right? All, all of us in some sense and capacity, there's different situations where we can handle change well and others where it's not. Change is an emotional event. And that in, in, event impacts each person in a different way. And we have to appreciate those differences in order to address the skepticism or the challenges in our path. You also have to appreciate that change and trying new things, while it's not comfortable for people, we also have to ensure as those disruptors who are bringing those change, that instead of drawing a line in the sand and saying it's this way or no way, we have to be willing to reach across that line and sometimes support individuals a little bit more to get them moving towards that line of success. You know, we shouldn't be building bridges. I mean, sorry, we shouldn't be building walls. We should be building bridges. And sometimes as we build those bridges, we really have to help others cross that bridge. And that's perfectly okay. Um, it's important that you have to be willing to put your own ego and pride aside in order to bring others to, to address that mentality of it's not broke, don't fix it. I think everybody in the acquisition community can look and say like, yeah, this isn't working, but how do I change that? And, and, and when we say it's not broke, so don't fix it, it, that's the killer of organizations. You know, you can look in the private sector and there's so many examples of businesses who focus so much on their line of businesses or what they were producing at that time that they failed to recognize that disruptors that were entering the market and ultimately made them obsolete. Think of video stores who failed to recognize um, online streaming, which was a huge disruptor. So they failed to change their business plan 
retailers who focused on the big box mentality versus moving to an online retail platform, they've become obsolete. And we can do the same thing in the acquisition community as well. The best thing from a culture perspective to break down the barriers is top cover. Having leaders who recognize that it isn't perfect and trusting those in the weeds day to day who are delivering that product to the end user and the customer and the industry to solve the problem is huge. Knowing that you have a leader who is interested in solving the problem and creating a safe space for you to try and succeed or fail, and that's okay is crucial that you're not going to be in trouble, that it's not going to cost you your job. You know, there's very few things in the acquisition community that isn't modifiable or correctable and is based upon the business decision and the information that you knew at that time. And you grow from that and you move from that and you make things better going into the future. So those are just a few of the ideas that I have as far as like addressing the skepticism and really the main area area it comes down to is providing that top cover. Awesome. So to piggyback off of what you just said, you mentioned disruptors a couple of times, helping others cross that bridge. Uh, a lot of times we can be seen in the acquisition community as a disruption. We can be the cog in the wheel. Um, how do you think that involving others outside of the 1102 community, um, say folks from the legal department or policy or the um, program team, um, how is involving them in the innovation process um, making people more comfortable with taking risk and creating a cohesive team? It's, it's crucial. Um, one time I had an interview and it, the, the question that they asked me was, should contracting get in the way of mission? Contracting should never get in the way of mission. Contracting is the enablement. So what do we have to do as that enablement to make the mission happen? It's so crucial that we involve all the stakeholders as we implement innovation. We just don't want to create another roadblock for ourselves. And if we fail to bring all those stakeholders into this process and into this innovation, then we're really just creating a roadblock for yourselves. I've worked with many legal and policy teams where the first time I sat down with them to share an idea or a new thought of how we could look at something, they looked at me like I had four heads. Like I'm so used to people looking at me like I'm crazy. <laughs> um, and, and I once had an attorney that every time I called them, they were like, oh no, what do you have for me now? Should I be scared? Um, but in the end, I respected them. They respected me. We built relationships and we grew together. And, and as time went along, they felt more comfortable coming on this journey. Another example was when we had a PM that was very, very uncomfortable in kind of a bake-off competition concept that we were doing to find the best technology for a salute, um, for, for a problem set. And we spent many, many hours talking to them, coaching them, addressing their concerns, reassuring them, and letting them know that we were there to support them. And it, you know that, that was a challenge. It took time. But through that relationship and through that collaboration of reaching across the aisle um, as a partner, we, we brought them along. And a year later, they were so happy that they had trusted, trusted us and that decision because they were able to realize a solution that they hadn't even thought possible. And, you know, those small successes, the, those grassroots effort of reaching across the aisle and bringing those, the, those individuals into the innovation journey is what's going to change the culture as we try these new things is because it shows those successes and it shows how we can do it and how we can improve it. And that's just crucial to what we are trying to do. Gotcha. So you said, you know, the communication, it sounds like that's the key. And in some sort of patience that it's not going to happen overnight, we're not going to have a stakeholder buy in day one, and everyone's not going to be, um, you know, completely comfortable with assuming risk. But right. it's a uh, effort of patience and keeping those lines of communication open that will encourage people to build that trust. Correct. And, and, that, and that's exact, exactly it. And sometimes 
we, we have to be willing to compromise. You know, we, we can see like there's maybe there's 10 great things that we could do that would help improve the process, but managing that risk of bringing others along onto that journey and across that bridge, we might have to compromise on four. And that makes them comfortable because they saw that success that the next time they're willing to try more, or we bring in examples or we, we, we coach them and communicate with them and got to provide that safe space. Cause we have to remember change in no matter what form it is, everybody reacts to that change differently. And we have to appreciate those differences and those experiences that each person is bringing to that table. Awesome. So a lot of times I hear whenever I pitch a new idea, it's just a group. That's an awesome idea. Let's do it next round. Let's do a next right. solicitation. Let's do it after we get through our current challenge and then let's focus on it. Yes. How do you really draw that line in the sand or push to include innovation as it's occurring versus, you know, kicking the can down the road? Right. When you provided that example to me, it instantly made me think of this meme I saw where that uh, it's it's a Honda Accord versus a Ferrari, right? And a KO is explaining how an OTA can get them the Ferrari, but everyone goes back, but I want simplified acquisition. Like they go back to the, the Honda Accord. And it's a very, very funny meme if you've ever worked in the OTA land of that that's the challenge. People want to go back to what they are comfortable with. And, and, and part of getting them is one that compromise I talked about. Um, okay, for, for example, uh, KO knows that an OTA is the best route for this procurement, but the customer feels more comfortable with simplified acquisition procedures or those traditional mechanisms that they, that they are used to. You, you can't convince them of the OTA, but what can you convince them in, in the FAR base? What can you convince them? Is it, uh, is it the commercial solutions opening where you are using FAR-based techniques? Or is there another technique that you can improve? Like bringing in those like little small things of maybe we're going to do confidence ratings. Maybe we're going to do demos. Have you heard of oral presentations? There is always something that we can do different and provide business advice that we can bring in those small things and show them success so we're not losing that momentum of waiting to the next time because but we all know by the next time that that comes around the KO is going to be different program manager is probably going to be different the legal might be different and you lose that good idea fairy by the time the next time comes around so there's always some good idea fairy that we can bring in to the process even if it can't be the big bright shiny object that we know is possible Gotcha. So how do you encourage your group and the pill to keep innovation fresh, to constantly be on the lookout for what the next thing is? Is it through uh, understanding what's going on in industry? Is it through stakeholder engagement internally? How do you I, uh, identify and grow your list of projects um, from an innovation perspective? Um, we constantly, well, we constantly have to be on the lookout. Us as innovators, we also have to continually be uncomfortable. We can never get into a position where we become the status quo, that we become part of that, that clog in the machine that that that's preventing us from moving forward and becoming, well, we've always done it this way, or this is the way we've always done it. So we um, engage with the AIAs, we reach out to industry, we do interviews with industry, we participate in events like this, where it is industry and government coming to the table. We participate in roundtables. We're always looking for those opportunities and those feedbacks of what are we missing? What things are being done by other people in other federal sectors or the DOD that we can bring, that we can build upon. So part of it is pushing the team not to become comfortable and also already taking what is being done out there that is good and bringing it into our ecosystem where we can provide it to our community of interest as well. I think there's a lot of potential and there's a lot of growth and it's, it's, it's an area that is 
on the table at, for conversation across the board in the federal sector. And I think it's something that we really, really have the opportunity to, like I said before, not become that business that fails to look at the ever-changing landscape so that we can stay viable and we can go into the next, to that next iteration of innovation. Gotcha. So I've been tallying up the number of times you've said disruptor, and I'm counting we're at four right now. How do you keep being a disruptor without being a disruption or a distraction to the ultimate mission? Um, that's a great question. I, I think a lot of it comes down to building trust and building partnerships and coalitions. Uh, when you are a disruptor and you're bringing new ideas, you have to get people to trust you. So a lot of it is about building trust and building those coalitions around yourself. Um, I would probably say my parents don't think I'm a disruptor. They probably thought most of my life I was a disruption. So <laughs> I try very, very hard um, not to bring that into the work, work workplace and, and the field. It, it's about being a partner. It's about uh, being humble, recognizing your own your own strengths and your own weaknesses, and really reaching across that aisle and being a partner as you are trying to deploy new ideas and new ways of doing things. Um, it, I, I can't tell you, I can't stress it enough of how important it is to build that relationship and that trust. And, and to have a leader, which fortunately I'm, uh, DHS is an organization, our OCPO, that, that has created that environment from a top cover to try this. And that is so, so very important to support being a disruptor versus being a disruption. And the pill is voluntary to participate in versus mandatory. If it was made mandatory, then then we become a disruption. Because all of us, we're all professionals, right? We don't like people telling us what to do when we've reached, you know, that journeyman level, like we got this, you know? And so by being voluntary and by allowing others to come to us and us reaching across the table, that's really how we can maintain being a disruptor versus a disruption. Awesome. Thank you so much. That's great. Um, I took a note of that, the voluntary versus mandatory. I think when you're voluntold to do something, there's a lot more pushback than if you Yes, I hate being voluntold to do anything. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's um, a weakness. I know that. <laughs> I think that's everyone on this call is the same way. Um, so speaking of risks and innovations, what are some of the things that y'all are working on in the pill that you're going to plan on rolling out in the next 12, 24 months? Uh, While well, you're putting me on a little spot here, because um, I'm, you know, I'm just coming into the pill and I'm in full stride of learning what is and isn't needed uh, in this role. Uh, the pill, you know, we're in our stride. Uh, we have really great boot camp uh, portfolio that we put out with our trainings. Now we've added that next level training, which adds nine additional techniques and incorporates lessons learned uh, from some of the techniques that we taught in the boot camp. We're providing coaching clinics. And we, which help others, you know, that grassroots effort I kind of mentioned earlier, uh, where there were individuals through the coaching clinics are learning how to become their own innovation advocates. Just within the past year, two of our components have stood up their own innovation cells, which is amazing because it means innovation is being embraced um, at even a lower level than the headquarter level. Um, but as an entity, I think in the next 24 months, we will begin to look at where we need to go and where we need to evolve. Uh, we have to analyze what is changing and what we can do to address it and meeting what our customer needs are and, and, and recognizing that in some areas we may have hit saturation. Uh, many of our in innovations focus on evaluation techniques. So one of the things we have to ask ourselves in the pill is do we need to look at techniques that maybe are gonna support more post-award admin challenges that us in the procurement community um, regularly see. You know, as it relates to pricing, clin structure, our ability, ability to rapidly in, um, incorporate change orders, 
as we learn uh, going along on a project without significant time or negotiation? Are there innovations that we can focus on from a pre-award element to help remove barriers of entry, entry uh, barriers of entry for small businesses or new entrants, especially as it relates to technology? How can we develop upon the techniques that we've already have that demonstrate uh, success and, and, and evolve them that it's less of a capital input by industry to be able to propose? We're all in the business money and time and time is money. So what are we doing to decrease that um, resource, resource perspective, not only from an industry, but government standpoint? Um, some of the other things we can uh, possibly be looking at in the next 24 months is what innovations allow us to continue to remove that curtain uh, that industry so many times uh, says the government is famous for of uh, the lack of information. Like you put in a proposal and then you hear nothing and all of a sudden a war comes out. Uh, so what can we do to remove that curtain and start sharing those information, whether it's insight into a requirement or a process? We, we've got to increase trust in the process um, with industry and government and build better relationships. So what techniques can we do to bring that into the process? What, what can we do to help remove the silos of information barriers that we see in the federal space? You know, uh, the nail at NASA is doing great things. The pill has done great things. Um, CDAO is doing great things. Army is doing great things. Navy, you know, there's all these great things going on. How can we remove those silos and make all that good that is going on, all that innovation that's going on available across the federal space where it's easy for that acquisition professional to find it and access that? And one thing I would also love to see happen in the next month, 24 months is us increasing and expanding our crowdsourcing initiatives. This is where we gain ideas from, for innovation from those who are doing the day-to-day -day operational acquisition and procurement so that we can understand what their challenges are, what their solutions are to solve those problems and incorporating them and uh, putting it at more of a strategic level or being able to expand it uh, to more of the community. So that's where, off the top of my head, the next 24 months, um, some of the ideas that we're, we're, we're talking about of where we need to go. Gotcha. So it sounds like there's a lot going on. Um, <laughs> yes, there's definitely a lot of learning going on. Uh, you know, it was, it was a humbling experience coming into the pill. And, and that's what I love about this career is that there's always something new to learn. And I love it that, you know, after 25 years, I'm still learning stuff every single day and I'm able to have those conversations and, and learn and engage in information. That's just exciting to me. Awesome. So I know in a previous life, you were with an organization where AI was in the name. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that you're bringing some of that and the pills doing some stuff with AI. Mm -hmm. um, how do you think that AI can help the acquisition workforce? Uh, how can leveraging big data help uh, the acquisition workforce? What do you see in that space that you could bring in from your previous life? Um, personally, I feel AI and bots are game changers for our workforce. We deal with a lot of information. There's a lot of policy. There's a lot of data. and and you know, anytime that there's a policy or a new requirement, and I'm telling, I'm taking the lanes from a procurement aspect of the acquisition field, it always falls on the shoulders of the KO to execute. You know, the KO shall, the KO will do this. And there's a lot. And, you know, every organization has bandwidth constraints. We have resource constraints. So what can these tools do to help us eliminate bandwidth constraints that prevents the KO from being able to do things that are kind of like those ankle biters in our admin. CPARs, I, I think you talk to any KO in the community, like CPARs is a struggle to get done because we're so focused on execution. Closeouts, closeout is a huge issue facing us. So what AI, bots, technology out there that can help us make us, help us make us do our job better and meet some of those statutory requirements that we have to do. You know, I mentioned that we place such a focus on execution that a lot of times we're not able to do that continuous market research. So it's not getting the attention that we need. You know, what bots are available to help the closeout process? What bots are available to help us do co continuous market research? 
so that the KO and the acquisition community can have that best information at their hands while they're making the decisions and ensuring that they're completing all the paperwork that is required of us throughout not only pre-award, but post-award. Um, it's impossible in this field, whether you're um, on the execution side or the program management side, to know it all. There are so many regulations, there are so many policies, deviations, and it's, it intrigues me is what can AI do and that technology do to help us be better to know what is out there that makes it more efficient for us to lift and see examples of successes that allows us to make better decisions and not recreate the wheel or find synergies with other agencies who maybe have already solved the problem and offer us an opportunity to collaborate. You know, so many times we go and do something and then somebody goes, well, I've already done that. And so like, what, what can that technology and that machine learning help us find that information to help us do our jobs better and help solve a problem uh, that we have facing us? Um, I think it's powerful tools to help us remove things in our day-to-day -day that creates time lag. Uh, for example, streamlining congressional notifications, EEO compliance, SAM checks, CPARs, past performance, market research, creation of art package, creation of statement of works. There's so many possibilities out there with this technology that can help us do our job better. But AI is scary. Um, we all think we understand AI. Uh, but we don't understand AI. And um, it makes us nervous. You know, when everybody thinks of AI, they think robots taking over the world. And, you know, Hollywood hasn't helped with that, that narrative much. But any AI or any technology we bring into this process, it still is going to have that human element and that human touch. That subject matter expert, that human element that come in, comes in and looks at that data that has been streamlined and that is gonna use that data to help inform a better decision with the latest information that's out there and taking advantage of the time that it saves for us to conquer all that the workforce has to do. There is a lot of requirements on our workforce. And so whatever we can do to help make that job easier and start addressing some of those ankle biters, I'm here for it. And as you can tell, I'm pretty passionate about what I think <laughs> AI can do, so. Well, it's so interesting that you were talking about, you know, so some of the low hanging fruit and, you know, some of taking care of some of the things that people don't have time to do on a day to day basis, because last month during this, uh, hopefully people who are recurring members remember that we had Liz Trico from DOD and mm -hmm. Liz was uh, had an entire session talking about some of the bots that they're using and how it's making people some jobs easier um, mm -hmm. and how it's also resulting in cost savings for their organization for the DOD. Yes. So I think yes. that it's a dual, a dual hat. There's a dual benefit there mm -hmm. to um, make people's lives easier, to free up time to do other things that are maybe more high value to them, um, but also, you know, create a cost savings for the government. Yes. And I love Liz. Liz is a game changer. And some of the stuff she's just, she's doing and champion is, is exactly, you know, the perfect example of like where we need to go, the, the cost savings it provides. And, and I think if you went out to the uh, contracting community and, and, and ask the KOs, what are they constantly getting beat up about? Their CPARs, their closeouts. <laughs> um, and, and, and I have to admit, I've, I rolled on that in the past when my boss would come and talk to me and like, but I'm focused on execution. What do you want me to do? But anything that can help us meet those requirements, I think is value add. And it's, we, we, we need to invest in that um, because that increases the bandwidth of our, our, our employees and our workforce to be able to do the actual execution. And I will say that I'm guilty from the industry side of um, harassing CEOs and saying, where's our CPARs? Where's our CPARs? <laughs> um, you know, because it's becoming more important that we have rateable past performances. So, uh, you know, people are on the horn with y'all all the time, I'm sure, asking mm -hmm. where those are and you're trying to get your next solicitation out. So, right. And, and, and I was a KO who was guilty of always being late on CPAR. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so you talked a little bit about, 
you know, removing the silos and breaking down the barriers. Is there any cross collaboration going on with the pill and other government agencies or industry with regards to innovation creation and adoption? Yes, there is. So like I mentioned earlier, we sit on the AIA Council, which brings um, innovation teams from different federal agencies together. And that's where we share a lot of ideas. That's where we're starting to find out what others are doing. Uh, we get demos of things that we're doing. We're able to see and we're able to bring that knowledge back. That That is super crucial. And it's it's a lot of fun um, participating in that um, in that council because it's always enjoyable to sit down with individuals who are very like-minded and very passionate about this field and just to hear what they're doing and see, seeing how they're addressing it and solving their problems. Uh, we started to host boot camps uh, with other agencies and that is helping us do cross collaborations. We're getting a lot of great positive feedback from other agencies who are participating in our boot camps. We're even going to other agencies and hosting boot camps uh, for them. So I think that's super, super exciting and a really great way that we're starting to cross, uh, reach across that aisle. We coach uh, uh, teams from other agencies. Teams submit our the one page pill uh, request into the pill, and we are supporting other teams um, in DOD and other federal sec sectors in innovation techniques. Uh, participation in this type of event, ACT IAC. You know, I love that so many of the team is chairpersons and participating in this meetings and providing value into this cross, cross collaboration between government and industry participating in NCMA roundtables. But again, what the pill can do, continue to do is help innovation of others become more accessible. And I think that's just something we should continue to strive for is when we hear those good idea fairies or where we hear those good stories, bringing it to the forefront, to making it accessible to more and more in the community, making it easier to access so that others can learn lessons and and, and participate in creating their own little grassroots innovation cells. Awesome, thanks so much, Katie. Um, I have one last question for you and then we'll open it up to Q and A's. Um, but you know, how do you, Katie Crompton, define success? And at the end of the day, what's the legacy that you want the pill to leave behind? <laughs> well, um, how do I find success? Um, that's a great question. Um, I find I define success is that we tried something and we learned from it. As long as we have learned from whatever we are doing, we are successful. And I think that goes into what I want the la my lasting legacy or the pills lasting legacy to be. Um, first, I hope my lasting legacy is when I do. Uh, hand on my retirement papers as people are sad to see me go versus cheering because <laughs> I am. That's my main goal. Um, but in all seriousness, I hope that what we're doing has value, that we were able to help sustain what is already amazing, create an environment that allowed that um, all the awesomeness that is going on to grow, and that we were able to help break down the red tape to allow others to achieve great things. I am a firm believer. And you should always be training your replacement, but we should also be creating that environment for that future acquisition professional or that future procurement professional to be able to build upon. Like as a society, we've we continue to get better. You know, we have our hiccups, but you know, a couple hundred years ago, we didn't have a car. Now we have self-driving cars. So we're constantly growing and we're constantly striving. And so whatever we do is that we're creating something for that next generation or that next professional who's coming behind us, that they're gonna be able to do great things because we set them up for success. And I think that effective leadership is a key there. You know, I remember as a young contracting officer, I would come to leadership with ideas. You know, I think we can do this better. I think we can mm -hmm. adopt this innovation. And, that, and if you get shut down, you know, it, could, it can be demoralizing after a couple of times. And that's why you right. see some people leave the acquisition workforce is that there's so much status quo. Mm -hmm. So talking about that effective leadership and how that can stimulate a uh, continuous process and improvement and uh, innovation adoption, I think is absolutely spot on. 
Yes, it, it, it's crucial. And so many times I have seen where really great ideas have started because you had the acquisition professional, end user, legal, like everybody on the table and leadership supported it and leadership changed. And then the new leadership came in and didn't support it and it died. And so that is why it's so, so crucial to create that foundation to, 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 to grow those leaders, um, to, to grow those professionals that they can have that space to share those ideas. And even if it's an idea not accepted at that time, that they know that they were heard and that they feel comfortable coming with that next great, great idea that they, that they want to implement. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Um, I do want to open it up for the last part of the discussion to folks' questions. Um, I do see one question that we received. Um, is there a um, something that y'all are working on or that you have ideas about um, prototyping as part of the down select um, process? Mm -hmm. So um, go ahead. Yeah, so I've had that um, not here at the pill, but I had that in a former life where we did do prototyping as part of the down select process and then bake those two prototypes off against each other. And there was great success in that because it one allowed us to see how it was solving our solution. It had a low cost of barrier of entry for industry. It had low cost um, for us to know if something worked or didn't work before we invested a lot of capital and a lot of time into it. And then by looking at those technologies, putting it into the environment to solve our problem, we were then also to get better insight into what do we really want from tech data rights? What do we, do we want full GPR? Do we not want full GPR? We saw that this technology solved this problem and this technology solved that problem. So there really wasn't a solution that was going to solve the whole problem. So how can we get those, those technologies to work together? So that is such a valuable tool. And I really see that as a great mechanism to help us make better decisions because so many times we spend a lot of time in the solicitation process and the acquisition process and then the development process to have something that's delivered that doesn't work. I'd rather know something in 90 days doesn't work and I invested $100,000 than not knowing something worked after three years and hundreds of millions of dollars. Absolutely. Um, Scott, I think that um, Nicole yep. sent you a question. Yeah, we got a question from Brandy and she asks, uh, what kind of metrics do we track across the acquisition workforce to see you know, what pill-based innovations are being used? Great question. So we are using, um, we've started to establish some quantitative and qualitative metrics internally within the pill based upon the projects that are coming into the pill, uh, you know, tracking timelines, tracking the techniques used, doing uh, post-award interviews with industry and uh, the government to see like what, ha what was going good, what wasn't going good. We're doing things internally, um, uh, the CVF, CV, CVF framework, which uh, measures like four things as far as innovation, culture, leadership, things like that. And that also feeds into the metrics we do with each of our trainings, satisfaction surveys. So we're gathering a lot of information and we're using this tool to kind of help us compile those metrics to help us better make decisions going forward as far as what techniques we're going to use, what is working, what we have kind of reached saturation, we're kind of starting to see um, maybe like a downward decline in, in some of our trainings and some of the stuff that we're, we're providing because we've gotten it out to such a wide audience. So what, where, where do we need to go from here? So we are doing that. Um, I probably turned it over to Scott because he would know the metrics way better than I, because he's been living this dream longer than I have dream in a positive way, not a nightmare. <laughs> and, uh, but that, that, that's some of the stuff we're doing to see, what value we are providing with the stuff that we are providing back to industry and to the government. Awesome. Um, so I see another question here is, how are y'all leveraging innovations that are happening in industry to help the government acquisition process? So one of the things that uh, we have done is, like I mentioned before, is doing the post-award interviews. That's 
where we go out to industry and that have participated in pill projects and, and ask them questions. And so we're getting feedback from industry of like, well, this is working, this isn't working. Um, we are bringing industry in. We now have boot camps that industry can attend. So that is helping us get valuable feedback from industry into what we're doing and getting insight into like, we're, we're, we're saying these things and we're believing these things and industry is coming back and like, oh, it doesn't, it doesn't mesh. Um, not a pill example, but an example from a former life is, you know, we were, um, we were getting feedback from industry of, Hey, it takes you guys forever to go through your, your, your legal review processes. Mm -hmm. And so, or, or just processes and reviews. So we went out and we looked internally in our own reviews and we streamlined them and we went back to industry and industry's like, wait, now you're moving too fast. So I think it's, that we need to constantly be looking for that feedback and listening to industry of what they're doing so that we can start to incorporate it and refine our processes and innovation. But we are really bringing that olive branch out to industry and saying like, hey, tell us what you have going on because we're here to listen and we would love to incorporate it and learn from you. It's, it's, it's about crossing that aisle and communication of how do we get better together. Awesome. Um, so that leads to another question someone has is how do folks reach you? Um, how, if there's questions or comments or a request for follow on dialogue after this meeting, how can folks reach out and connect with you? all I am not prepared for that answer, but I'm going to turn it over to Scott Simpson because he knows it by heart. And I blanked on how you can reach us. Scott, over to you. If you want to reach us, you can always email pill at hq.dhs.gov. And we're happy to have a conversation and even to uh, provide some coaching. Uh, we also have industry uh, boot camps coming up. We've got an industry boot camp coming up on May 4th, if you'd like to attend. And we have an industry boot camp, the next level coming up on June 6th. So this is the first time we've ever offered boot camp, the next level to industry. So if you're interested in either one of those, you can send us an email and, uh, and you can sign up via regular industry uh, partnerships. Awesome. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Katie. Um, I will pause and let anyone get their last questions chatted in. All right, Katie. Well, I am very, very grateful that you've taken the time to talk with me and the COI about the things that you're doing at the Pill, and as importantly, or more importantly, how organizations can adopt innovation um, and how leaders can empower folks within their organizations to think big. Um, you know, as we wrap up, is there anything that you want to leave with the audience? Any final thoughts or words of wisdoms for the group? Um, put me on the spot there again. I would, say, <laughs> <laughs> I would say the best words of wisdom I can leave is believe in yourself. Uh, don't be scared to fail. Believe in yourself and, you know, you, you and, and trust in your decisions and, and, and find those, find your people in the community um, to start those grassroots efforts and, and you're going to accomplish just like great things. So I think that's my words of wisdom for Katie today. Awesome. Thank you so much, Katie. Um, Nancy, Nicole, Scott, anything from y'all for the acquisition of COI? I really appreciate everyone coming today, and I really appreciate uh, Katie and Terrell for uh, being with us. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. I hope that you have an awesome week, and we will talk to y'all next month during the open members meeting. Thank you again, Katie. Thank you so much. All right. Bye, y'all.